Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are sitting in the back row or if you are new here and enjoy what you're hearing, please consider hitting that subscribe button and setting your notifications to all. That way you are reminded every time I upload a video. Also, if you enjoy what you're hearing, you can buy me a coffee or if you're interested in becoming a member of the channel, that information can be found down below in the description box. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, we're tucking to get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled Neighbors from Hell. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Shortly after moving into my first apartment, I started having strange encounters with one of my neighbors on laundry night. I would pass through my neighbor's carport when it rained to get to the laundromat. He stood in the shadows a bit and startled me several times, possibly avoiding the rain. I tried to be friendly, but he would just stare at me smoking his cigarettes and not say a word. Soon it became a regular routine for him, and then the apartment across the way opened up, and he moved to that one. I changed laundry to a daytime event. One night, I sat out on my stoop on my phone and noticed a red light in the distance. It was him, sitting in the dark with a video camera pointed straight at me. I went inside to tell my friend who had just been crashing at my place for a few weeks, freaked out and relieved about the timing. That night, my friend who was staying with me went out, and when he was gone, I heard loud bangs. They sounded far away, but I used a sound machine to help me sleep, so I still couldn't be sure as to what it was. The next day leaving, we noticed the door wood around the deadbolt was all mashed up. I asked if he noticed it when he came back, but it was late, and he was a little drunk, so we weren't sure. The maintenance people were very concerned because it looked like someone tried to break in while I was home alone. Shortly after that, I left and got a new apartment. Luckily, my new roommate had an amazing big dog, and when she was out of town one night, I woke up at 3 a.m. to him growling at her window. I went over and ensured it was locked. The next day, my neighbors asked me if I locked myself out, and I asked, no, why? Sure enough, the screen on the outside was all twisted as if somebody tried to break in but got interrupted by the very big dog. The worst part was I had out-of-state plates and all of my friends kept telling me to get my plates switched because I was sticking out to the police. I often thought that he tracked me down by plates and tried again or maybe I was just being paranoid and these were a series of break-ins, looking for money, jewelry, etc. I should mention that I'm a French student with a story to tell, so I'll be translating it with chat GPT, so my English might not be too perfect. The story takes place during my first year of studies when I moved to a big city, experiencing living on my own for the very first time. Naturally, there were certain reflexes or cautions that I know I didn't have, as I was quite naive back then. Upon moving in, my mother and I carried all of my belongings from the car to my apartment. Through numerous trips, we inevitably met a neighbor. I lived at the end of the hall, and he too welcomed me. I'll describe him physically, and you'll understand later in my story why it was important. He was quite slim with a very square jaw, his face marked by alcohol and perhaps drugs in general. I'm not making assumptions, I just recognize faces that are marked by alcohol since my father has them too. For about six months, everything went well. He was one of the few neighbors I encountered. 
and we used to talk when we crossed paths. He was quite pleasant, so I never paid much attention to his appearance, which might have scared some people. It often happened that I'd ask him if he could lend me an egg or some milk and vice versa. At one point, the building management decided to change the entry badges, meaning we had to pick them up from the front management office to access the building. On that day, before entering the building leading to the apartment, I ran into my neighbor. He told me about the changed badges, and I remember feeling upset because I didn't have time to go to the management office to get them, and it was going to be complicated. He offered to lend me his badge since he had picked them up and we obviously had two in case one got lost. I thanked him immensely. Several days after retrieving the badges, I returned the one he had lent to me and life went on. A few weeks later, I can't exactly recall, he comes knocking on my door. He tells me he lost one of his badges, stumbles into his words doesn't seem really sure, and I don't know why, but I still lent him mine. A few days pass, and I start to worry because he still hasn't returned it. I ring his doorbell. No response. I feel uneasy the next day. Anyway, a week goes by, and still I have yet to hear from him. Haven't even seen him. I was very worried as... If he left my badge, it means I have to buy a new one. Did I trust a stranger? I don't know. Anyway, the holidays come, and I go back home to see my parents. After a week there, I return home and I realize I left my keys at my parents' place, which is over 600 kilometers away. Luckily, I had given a spare key to my sister, but the issue is that I was missing one. The badge that was with my keychain at my parents, and the other one my dad had. So even if my sister brings me the keys, I'll have to wait outside the building for someone to enter it, so I can get in. My sister says she'll arrive in about an hour and 30 minutes, so I know I'll have to wait a long time. Someone from the building enters, I go in with him, even though I know I still can't enter my apartment. I remember I'll wait outside. I go up to the Montpeller and wait outside my place with my suitcase, watching YouTube videos sitting on the ground. My sister says she won't be long and will be there soon. While waiting for my sister on the landing, I encounter someone coming out of the neighbor's apartment, but it wasn't the same person. I found out so strangely that I can't remember exactly what I asked, but I said, Do you live here? And he responds, Yes, I do. Tell me, are you the neighbor from across from me? In any case, he tells me he went on a five-month trip to see family. I can't recall which country, maybe Turkey? And he just returned home to find his apartment squatted. I am extremely shocked because... The person I see squatting his apartment is someone I had absolute trust in, or at least I believed to be a true neighbor. He explains that his lock was forced, his apartment was soiled, and he had over 1,000 euros worth of repairs to do because everything needed redoing, and, of course, nothing was cleaned. In short, it's a mess. I confess that at that time, I was completely shocked. I didn't expect it at all, and I was very angry because this fake neighbor had left with my badge, which is already extremely dangerous, as he can enter at any time. The worst part is because I'll have to pay for it, and as a student, yes, 40 euros hurt. If the story could end there, it would suit me well. But the problem is that it continues, and I still don't have the full story. For a little side note, his fake neighbor had already asked me for a small spoon at 3 in the morning, supposedly to make coffee. At that time, I was staying with a friend, 
We were drunk, didn't ask any questions. Now I realized I, probably for drug use. I don't pass judgment on people who use drugs since I also consume from time to time. It just amuses me to realize this now. After talking several times with this new neighbor, let's call him Jack to make it easier to follow. I understood that the housing is a subsidized accommodation to people in need of help. He tells me he pays 200 euros, which is 400 euros less than my apartment, even though we have the same setup. That is where it gets complicated because indeed, Jack's speech is always a bit incoherent. I never really understood what he was telling me. There are missing elements in his story, but at that time, I didn't find it suspicious. Another crucial thing to know was that the city where I live has a high number of homeless people, many of whom use drugs. Even though I defend them because I think when you live on the street, sometimes it's the only thing that can make you happy. I'm not here to judge homeless people or people who use drugs. However, it's essential to be cautious because you can encounter some very strange, even violent or malicious individuals. So, even though it's a pleasant city, you still have to be careful. This new neighbor Jack is becoming increasingly strange, even though he tries to appear very friendly. I feel he exudes exactly the same energy, the same vibe as my old neighbor, who, as it turns out, was not the real neighbor. I haven't told you, but a few months before, I had bed bugs at home. Not enough to be very worried, just a few. But my mom and I decided immediately to treat it or not let it linger any longer. This was during the time when the fake neighbor was still around. In the meantime, there were holidays, and I went to see my parents, which I didn't itch anymore. However, when I came back, it started itching again. I think for people who have had bed bugs, you know how paranoid you can become. So I didn't waste a second before calling the person who had treated my apartment. For those wondering, they were, indeed, bed bugs. There is no doubt about the traces of the bites. It starts like a mosquito bite, but it gets bigger and spreads everywhere. I had videos of my back covered in bed bugs. It was horrible. I hated being at home, and at the same time, I had no choice but to be there. When we treated it for the second time, the man who came told me to check if any neighbors also had them, because if it persists, it could be an infestation and not just an isolated case. I asked one of my neighbors who told me she didn't have bed bugs, but noticed that one of her neighbors on the same floor had thrown out his sofa this morning. Indeed, I'd seen it in the street, but I didn't know it was his. There was no doubt someone else on my floor also had bed bugs. I tried ringing his bell, but he didn't answer. I also decided to question my neighbor, Jack. To my surprise, he explained that he had had them for a very long time at his place. I was extremely surprised, so I asked him why didn't he call someone to treat it, and he jokingly said, <laughs> I don't need that, I use vodka and it works very well. You can imagine my shock that this guy used vodka to combat bed bugs. What I find even less logical is that he lives in subsidized housing. There are people there to take care of his apartment, and I'm sure he could get the assistance. Anyway, I called the building management to inform them that several of us had this issue. They said they would send a team as soon as possible. But I had already dealt with them twice, and I was tired of waiting. So my mom contacted the person who had treated my apartment the last two weeks to treat it immediately before I swear it's unbearable. The problem was that it wasn't treated in the other neighbor's apartments. I was sure I would get them back. So I just waited for the management to take care of the apartments across from me. 
but I knew it would take time. What was strange is that when the man came back to treat my place, he told me there were no signs of bed bugs. Meanwhile, I started itching again. I went to see a dermatologist who told me I had a kind of allergic, anxious reaction. There weren't any words to describe what she was saying, but she explained that my body, exposed to bed bugs, kept fighting even when there was nothing left. This meant that even psychologically, I managed to have physical bumps on my body that itched everywhere. I took a treatment, and just knowing that, it immediately eased, and I had no more bumps a week later. Meanwhile, I haven't seen my neighbor. He had completely disappeared. This wasn't really a problem for me, except that the building management said that as long as he wasn't there, they couldn't proceed with the cleaning of his apartment to get rid of the bed bugs. This worried me a lot, and once again, delayed the disinfection on my floor. However, a month and a half later, they finally came to treat the apartment across from mine. Jax and the other neighbors affected. Unfortunately, I couldn't meet the man who took care of it, as I would have liked to ask him what happened to Jack's apartment. At this point, I decided to call the building management to try to find out what happened. I explained absolutely everything I told you. The fake neighbor. The real neighbor who arrived but whom I haven't seen for several weeks. Of course, they didn't believe me. I remember they thought I was crazy on the phone, and I never decided to talk about the story again. The problem is that it spans about two years, and since I never talked about it earlier because I didn't want to worry about the story, I wanted everything to go well, of course. Telling a story that has been going on for two years is a bit complicated to articulate and appear authentic without sounding crazy. What I forgot to mention is that a few weeks before he disappeared, the police came to my door asking if I knew what time my neighbor came home. I told them I didn't know anything, that I was just a student, and with my classes, my schedule changed all the time, so I never really was there at the same time, so I didn't notice his schedule. They told me they would come back, not even a day later. In the morning, I heard the police ringing loudly and speaking loudly. At first, I think they're coming to talk to me since I can hear everything from my door. When I look through the peephole, I see several plainclothes officers in front of this apartment, waiting for him to come out. They ask him to come out immediately, to go to the police station to answer some questions, and if he doesn't come willingly, they will arrest him to bring him. My neighbor Jack decides to follow them, and since then, nothing. Since then, I have never seen my neighbor again. I've seen letters addressed to him just in front of the mailbox downstairs. I know it's illegal, but out of morbid curiosity, I decided to randomly take one of these letters to see if I could get answers to my questions. When I open the letter, it's a summons to court for theft. I don't remember the exact wording, but it was a theft on someone's property. I understand that he had broken in. It seemed quite serious, given the number of letters he had in front of him, all addressed by the same person for the court. I still don't know news of what happened, and today, Saturday, December 2nd, I noticed a new person who entered the apartment. I'll keep you informed if I come across any more stories about this apartment and its very strange neighbors. Apologies on the front end for the length, but I am at my wit's end. We bought our home about three years ago. When we moved in, it was clear that the house directly beside us was in rough shape. Just hadn't been taken care of. Peeling, 
paint, siding, general, dilapidated. But nothing sketchy looked like it was taking place here. In the three years that we lived here, things next door have gone from bad to worse. Drugs are clearly being dealt out of the home, and at any given time, it is occupied by five to ten people that rotate out constantly. These people are clearly strung out. Scabs, skin, and bones can barely walk many days because they are that high. Cars are in and out at all hours of the day and night. People walk down our street on foot 24-7 that enter and exit the home. It is impossible to tell who is actually living there because there are so many random people daily that hang there. Here are some events that have happened in the past three years. A 17-year-old child was shot and killed in their driveway shortly after we moved in. The police are there constantly. I'm not talking two cop cars. I'm talking on a monthly basis 10 plus cars. Vans blocking our road off to the address. Something that was going on inside their home. They stole the battery out of our riding lawnmower. They siphoned the gas out of our mower. They cut our chain link fence, snipped it from the bottom to top. We have had people enter our property and open the gate to our backyard in the middle of the night, just wandering around. A man in their yard threw knives into our yard. Just for fun? I don't know. Never really got an explanation on that one. They have ten dogs. Again, hard to tell with many people that are in and out constantly. And are breeding pit bulls. The dogs have jumped over our fence and run at us several times. We have this on camera. They have stolen packages off our front porch. We find this on camera and filed a police report. They returned our things. They parked a stolen car in the woods behind my other neighbor's house. Police were called. Car was towed. The neighbor is trying to sell his home so it is empty, and they are on his property at all hours of the night. He regularly finds needles in his lawn. If not weekly, then at least bi-weekly, we are awoken by a screaming domestic violence disturbance. They frequently do not have power. For an entire summer, people lived in tents in their backyard. Currently, they are using a generator to power the home. Our utilities are all through one company, so if they don't have power, they don't have water either. This list genuinely goes on and on. A few months ago, I hit my limit. We were woken up at midnight by a woman screaming. It sounded like she was being assaulted. We called 911 and went downstairs to see that a woman and two men were in our front yard with a dog tied to a tree. There was another dog there that the dog tied up was biting. They were beating the hell out of those dogs, breaking things over their backs, choking them, etc. to get them separated. It was horrifying. At one point, the woman brought out a knife and was screaming that she was going to stab the dog. Thankfully, they ended up getting them separated before that happened. They took one of the dogs into their home and left the other one out tied up to a tree in our yard. Cops eventually came and I basically did everything, which is what almost always happens. The woman denied that the dog was theirs. Of course it was. And the two men who were hiding in the back of the home and the cops could not offer without consent. Animal Control took the dogs that were tied up to our tree and they left. I'm constantly told that there is not much they can do. We're calling the police more times than I can count for theft, trespassing, child endangerment, animal cruelty, you name it. They came out, maybe arrest one person, and then another person spawns in their place. It's never ending. I am genuinely worried for my family's safety because the situation has been escalating for years. My neighbors are all equally concerned. 
but understandably less invested since we are the only ones that share their property line. The city also came out and investigated their home multiple times. As you can imagine, trash is everywhere. Windows, doors are missing and busted out. There's spray paint on the walls and doors, etc. According to the property records, the home is owned by an 85-year-old man. According to the city inspector, they cannot figure out if he's alive or dead and have no way of verifying that the people that live there now are lawfully there. The city and the cops who had explained that they are likely squatters. Everyone I talk to says their hands are tied and no one can do anything about it without finding the owner of the home. But in all actuality, we have no proof that the owner's body isn't rotting in the basement. I need help. I need a solution to this because I feel like I'm going insane. I can't go into my front yard without fear of a dog jumping the fence and charging at me. I can't get things delivered to my home without fear of them being stolen. I can't get a good night's rest because I'm constantly woken up by screaming. I can't let my own dog out in the backyard because I'm terrified they will harm him. I can't walk barefoot in the grass without fear of stepping on a needle. I'm watching animals being abused on my property and being told there's nothing that can be done. Surely there has to be something. I know laws vary by state and city, but I'm all ears for any advice. I consider myself in 1996 to be a rebuilding year in my life. I was 25 years old, fresh out of a relationship that crashed and burned right before the wedding. So deep was the crater and widespread fallout that I had to move to a different state to avoid my to-be father-in-law's friends in the law enforcement, who were making sure I spent time roadside with them at least four times in the first two months after it all ended. I started over in a new place with a lack of resources and connections that were going to make it hard to get back into shape before I turned 30. Still, I was free and beholden to no one, but my creditors, so I had that going for me. I lived in my means and rented a townhouse in a long row of properties in less than reputable part of town. I didn't have time to walk before, so I moved in. In fact, I rented the place unseen based on the online ad. It was close to the job, which was great because someone trashed my car the week before I had moved out, and I ended up driving a beat-up Dodge pickup that I bought with the last of my savings. Once settled, I was locked into the rental for 12 months, which oddly gave me a sense of performance in my new surroundings and helped me get to work on my new life and career in human capital management and training services position. The unit was at the end of the block of 12 with two bedrooms up top with a master bath and a half bath in the living area. It was not a massive space, but it felt empty for lack of any furniture. I slept on an inflatable mattress my first three months and used folding chairs and a card table to eat and watch television. The block was a place where people were either on their way back up or back down. Young kids in their first home, recently divorced with kids. The downturn from society in one way or another. There were fights domestic and otherwise, throughout the night. Drunken parties and birthday galas took over the block on weekends, but nobody ever interacted with other families for some reason. No one knew anyone else's name or business. At least that's what the cops told me the first time they stopped by to ask me if I had heard or witnessed something going on in the block. My immediate neighbors were just weird like a space monkey on your lawn. 
inviting you to an anal probe. Kind of weird. It was a circus of three. The short, wild-haired woman looked like a off-brand troll doll with big pink hair that defied logic and a malfunctioning soundboard that only shrieked when provoked. The tall, thin man looked like an average bald human might appear in an elongating funhouse mirror. I don't know how old they were, but they resembled old, worn-out furniture, like the contents of an elderly couple's storage locker, old and ready to be discarded. Troll doll lady and funhouse man were not fond of taking to neighbors or anyone. They were troubled people. Their fights would bleed through the shared walls and get louder when talking outside. They knocked on my only hanging art from the wall when one threw something against the other side. The cops knew them by their real names. There had been a child living there, but he or she had to be removed from the home. A frequent guest in their little David Lynch sitcom world was a guy named Chuck, so named because Troll Doll Lady would yell his name every ten fucking minutes anytime he was in the house. Chuck was a long-haul truck driver who parked his sleeper bag across the street every couple of weeks. For some reason, he didn't shower inside. So, Saturday mornings, he would often run the garden hose over the fenced-in area in the back to take a cold shower, which was a lovely first sight to see. I didn't know him or what was going on. He sometimes walked out back to take a long beer piss in the runoff drain. His aversion to indoor plumbing was never explained to me, but I am forever grateful I never walked out back to catch him popping a squat in the tree line, if you know what I mean. For about six months, I tolerated the noise, let the neighbors be the bad guys, and called the police when the fight went too loud for too long, or when they all got drunk and played their 80s punk records through the night and engaged in the song of their people howling at the moon. I got to a place where I was making enough money to buy real furniture or rent a better place. I still had a lease to honor, so I bought a sofa, a real bed, and a desk set up for an office. It was still minimalistic affair, but comfortable. The townhouse felt like my home for once, and suddenly the intrusions of the neighbors were twice as annoying. One night, Troll Lady got into a fight with a pizza delivery driver who knocked on her door by mistake but wouldn't give her the pizza. I only know this because the pizza and its box hit my front window at different spots. This shrieking pink-haired witch assaulted the driver which led to a light show by the police that rivaled a Mannheim steamroller Christmas show. I was left to clean the pizza off the window and call the office to replace said window. They refused until the neighbors agreed to pay. So I enjoyed a cracked window for a month before the court accepted her guilty plea over the property damage. Her arrest was around the same time residents on our block and the next one over began reporting burglaries, and I was asked by police if I had any information or experienced anything odd. Other than the three geek circus next door, I told him. I did not have anything for him. Fortunately, my work and social life were on the rebound. I met a girl and we headed off, though he stayed far from my house during the early part of the relationship. So I began spending more time away from home, though I would often come back late to the neighbors in a loud state of either bliss or rage. During the day, maintenance worked to replace the insulation and update the HVAC system along with the attic spaces along the entire block. I don't think much about it because the work was done while I was gone in the daytime and I assumed the property managers would be coming into my apartment at some point to access my attic, probably the last one as they started on the far end for mine. Quickly, I lost track of the project. One night, I came home and something felt a little off. The front door was locked, the windows intact, 
and the back door secured. However, it felt and even smelled a little off. Sometimes I could smell the tobacco when weed upstairs when it filtered up and over into the attic space, but I was sure someone had been there. I cleared the house in a short, quiet march, as my dad, a Marine, taught me to do, but found no one and nothing missing. My computer, two TVs, uh, everything else was intact, except... I went to grab a beer from the fridge to calm my nerves and found the six-pack missing. I was sure I had two scratch-batch stout packs for my last visit to Stewie's microbrew. The loaf of bread seemed to be a little shorter than the morning before, by several slices. I couldn't be sure, but I thought I might be missing some other items as well but wasn't sure if that was just one growing anxiety over being robbed. I wondered if maintenance had been to my place to inspect the window or work in the attic and help themselves to a snack and drinks. It would explain the musty smell in my apartment and given the people I knew who owned and managed the property, it would not surprise me if a couple of their day laborers took a load off for a bit. The smell was most present upstairs, but in my office, which was opposite of the neighbor's walls, so it wasn't lingering dank. It was clearly gem funk. I immediately assumed laborer because it had the most common sense to it, so I didn't report it to the police that night. The next morning, however, I discovered my medications missing from my cabinet. All of them. My Lexapro, my emergency anxiety medications, and my other bottles were gone. I checked the windows and doors again, now in a near panic. I called off work for the first time using a burglary as my excuse. I was the seventh house in two townhome blocks to be hit in the past two weeks. The fifth in my block and one of the five without signs of forced entry. The police wouldn't tell me much about the other incidents and didn't seem to believe that I locked my doors until I reminded them who had lived next door to me. By that time, I really didn't want to live in that place anymore. It no longer felt like home. I was sharing it with something I felt lingering in the air around me. There was a feeling of dread, a sense of violation knowing there was someone out there who was inside your life without permission. Once removed, it feels like living in a house without walls. And there was a serial burglar in a neighborhood where the cops traditionally left to work out its own problems and carry away the remains. A week after the break-in, a few things happened to fuck up my world even further. First, Troll Doll Lady returned home because she was on house arrest. A welcome party brought out all the freaks Friday night. Second, because I was a dumbass. I had to come home and pick up a few things I needed to spend the weekend with my new girlfriend. As she was already in the truck and we were to be on our highway out of town, there was no other choice but to bring her home with me. The lot, including my spaces, were filled with what looked like gridlocked in a demolition derby, so I had to park a good distance away. Third, she insisted on seeing the inside of my townhouse and take a pee before hitting the road. So I had to introduce her to the freak show next door before even setting foot inside. Fourth, on the way up the walk to the front door, we encountered Funhouse Man in the open doorway, gatekeeper to the drunk dumbassery inside. He was wearing his morning apparel briefs and a long shirt except with a can of Red Dog instead of coffee in his hand. Fifth, Funhouse Man looked at us coming up the walk and spoke to me for the first time in seven months. You, <laughs> you tapping that? I think he said, his wet mouth spitting the words and dead eyes scoping my girl. I shifted to put myself between them on the sidewalk as we closed in on the door. 
and fished my keys out of my pants. Funhouse men panicked, letting out a squeal before diving inside and slamming the door. The party went silent instantly. Sixth, my girl was unnerved by this and lost all of her thrill over being with me in that place. She walked inside my home and registered her immediate disapproval. She didn't even want to pee there. I remember making some excuses saying it's a temporary thing and that the first step to a better living, etc. But it was the beginning of the end for us. Like she caught me cheating with Trodol Lady or something. Seventh, I didn't realize the path had spilled out into the front lawn and in front of the townhouse until I opened the door to see Chuck. The truck driver standing over my porch lamp looking drunk, stupid, and angry. He was joined by a few strangers who looked equal parts the same condition, and also like I had just fired the lot of them from the sideshow. I stopped inside the screen door trying to think of anything to say, clever or otherwise. Chuck, the truck driver, started the conversation. You go at Kenny? Uh, what? Nah, shit for brains. Ask if you went after Kenny in his own home. Nothing like that happened, but I knew immediately that my reality was not shared by those gathered in front of their own home. No, he said something. I got closer to Bear. He squealed like a little girl and ran inside. End of story. I was okay at the end of the first two sentences, but my anger got the best of me by the start of the third, and it did little to calm down the group, which had swollen to about a dozen people looking for blood or things to break. Chuck was not convinced by my answer and took a step forward to open my screen door. He put a hand on the knob and stopped. You step out here or I come in there. Go take a shit in a tree. You're not coming in here, and I'm not bleeding over that weirdo friend of yours. You can go beat each other like you normally. Eighth, the words stopped there because Chuck had punched a hole in my screen to get to my face. I fell back and accidentally tackled my now firmly ex-girlfriend. Fortunately, I didn't have much in the way of furniture to break on the way out. The only thing going for me at that moment was the miraculous arrival of police drawn by the parking fiasco and the noise. My face was broken. My newest ex had a bloody nose and a sprained shoulder, and I was out a good $400 in deposits for a weekend that would never happen. In short order, a few things happened. Chuck went to jail, and the charges against him would become the least of his problems. The party turned into story time, where partygoers spun their best yarn about how I insulted, assaulted, beat, or ass raped Kenny, the funhouse man. I was questioned about the encounter by police and spent time with an EMT who totally failed to impress enough to get her number. I was let go as several of the partygoers were arrested for either public drunkenness, disorderly conduct, or outstanding warrants. I'm sure this warmed me to the neighbors and their friends. My weekend companion was rescued from it all by a friend who drove her out of my life forever. You would think eight things in short order would be enough. I had to continue living next to these fuck-ups for at least four more months and I was going to spend those months terrified by what they might do to my property while I was working or the burglars coming back. However, ninth, I woke the next morning to the neighbors cleaning up from the party. Glass and aluminum, plastic and cardboard packed two full size bins. Credit where it's due, the fuckers recycled. From the what the fuck position in my bedroom window, I noticed two of the bottles stood out from the Keystone, Red Dog, and Milwaukee labels. They were the scratch batch labels from my six pack. Now, there was a chance that they were brought to the party by a guest with a better taste in beer than friends. 
but that was too much of a coincidence. My brain presented questions I could not answer. Where is the attic access in my townhome? I just assumed there was one somewhere and never really actually looked or came across it. So how did maintenance get all the way into it? While totally unrelated to the beer bottle on a conscious level, my paranoia and cynical nature collaborated on a series of connections. As I looked around the house for a drop that I had missed for months, my brain worked in its weird way to line up facts in such a way that it would sound insane if I wrote it all out. I went upstairs. My office was where the funk smell had been most pungent. I looked around again and decided to check the closet. I didn't check it before because there was nothing in it. On the carpet, I noticed a light dusting of drywall and paint flecks. I assumed it was rubbing from the sliding door against the wall and not equally along the track. The closet only had hanging shelves on the interior side. Looking up, I expected to see an attic access port, but found a jarred square carved into the drywall ceiling. Management was not exactly flip this shack quality, but I didn't think that they would use a box cutter to carve a hole in my ceiling, and none of them were skinny enough to even fit through that. Funhouse Man was skinny enough to potentially weasel up and down, the scuff mark on the inside wall of the closet was pretty telling. It took a while for the police to make their way over in response to my non-emergency call, but it quickly gathered their interest when the first responding officer reported what everyone missed the first time they did a half-assed search of my home. Three unmarked cars arrived after the initial squad car. My neighbors were uncharacteristically quiet, once the first cruiser rolled up at around noon. I offered a folding ladder, and the police looked up into the blistering hot attic. A hole had been cut for the insulation and a spot in the corner wide enough for a small or slender person to fit through. I was questioned again downstairs for about an hour before I heard more noises upstairs than I remember going up there. Before I could ask, a familiar face appeared at my door. My landlord, Ahmed. He looked concerned and astonished, which was a new expression. And the third after this, can I take your money? And his general resting fuck-off face. What has happened? He asked. What is going on? Are you all right? He walked into my home without invitation and up to me on my sofa. I asked him if he was there to fix my cracked window. Everything else happened without my direct involvement. I remained a guest in my own home for most of the day as police took photos and marched up and down my stairs. I learned that my assumption about the attic work was wrong, that workers had to access specific units to get around the firewalls between them. In fact, there were holes in the firewall that allowed workers to enter the roof in one unit and run the entire length of the building. It was a measure that saved time and footsteps, but was a violation of several law and codes, meaning that Ahmed's life was about to become much more complicated and expensive. These gaps in the firewalls also allowed someone to drill a hole in their own ceiling and run the length of 11 other homes, walking on the same boards laid by the property owners that muffled their presence. Every single unit in that block had a hole similar to the one in my ceiling. Further, at one time, the building had been wired for cable through the roof and holes that had been cut to finish cable into the upstairs bedrooms had been plugged up for years earlier during an upgrade. Some of those patches had been replaced with removable plugs, giving someone a clear view into various bedrooms. In the attic, police found a step stool with a rope tied to the top step. It was stashed away in the corner of the roof over my next door neighbor's unit. 
But that's not the weirdest thing. Though all evidence pointed to the main access point being the smaller bedroom in the neighbor's unit, police did not arrest Funhouse Man or Troll Doll Lady for the crime. Around 3 in the afternoon, police had recovered some stolen items from other units along with various controlled substances. True Doll Lady was arrested for violating the terms of her bond. Funhouse man taken in for the drugs. I was shocked to see a third person, not Chuck, walk out from the townhouse in cuffs. I'd never met him before. He was real thin, thinner than Funhouse man was by half. An old man's face and a young man's body with scars and bruises all over his skin that I've never ever seen, even on corpses, white and wax. He was naked except for soiled basketball shorts. He literally recoiled as if allergic to outside air and sun and had to be dragged shoeless to the cruiser. I don't know who that kid is, but I got the feeling he never left the townhouse ever. Maybe not even the attic. The thought that this skeletal creep was looking in on me and had access to my life makes me overly cautious these days. I have two eyes everywhere in my home, and I take plans to inspect the smallest spaces in and around my property. I often wake in the middle of the night seeing that face peering at me through a window or from a dark room. It's been a long time ago, and everyone I mentioned in this story by name is dead. I don't know about the kid though. I never got a name and was unable to find him in any police record. Maybe he doesn't really exist. Maybe he didn't show up on any records and is languishing in prison as John Doe. Or maybe he's out there lurking in some upper level of an apartment building or hiding inside the basement or walls. I've never, ever left truly home since then. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true neighbors from hell stories. I would like to take a brief moment and acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elias, Sugared Spike, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Colt Stonewolf, Luz Crispin, Samantha Place, Patty's Niece, Denise S, Me Carter, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for continuing to support Back to Ashes, for without you, there wouldn't be a me or the channel. If you are sleeping, I hope Summerland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good night. Peace, love, and light to you all.